Doc Discussions with Dr. Jason Edwards, brought to you by St. Luke's, St. Louis. Welcome to Doc Discussions. So today I'm going to talk with Dr. Craig Reese, a cardiologist here at St. Luke's, about diet, medication, and heart disease and ways to reduce your risk of heart disease. Craig, how are you doing today? Thank you. And thank you so much for asking me to be on your podcast. Yeah, it's my pleasure for sure. Now, first, tell me, where are you from, Craig? Where... I'm from St. Louis. St. Louis. And yeah, and you know, the, the famous St. Louis question, right? Is yeah. Where you went to high school. So, you know, <laughs> I, I went to Ladue. Very good. And so came, I... came back home. I'm not from St. Louis, so I, I like kind of know some of the high schools, mm-hmm. and so, uh, so so I'm I'm learning over time, though. Very good. So, it's very important in St. Louis <laughs> to know that. What are what are the most important things? Absolutely. And so, uh, and you did your training. Um, uh, where where did you go to school? So I went from high school. I went to the a six year med program at University of Missouri, and then I trained at Harvard at the Brigham, and I was there for. Six years, and I did my uh, my medicine, my cardiology, and a chief residency, and then I came back to St. Louis. All in Boston. How about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I came back to came back to St. Louis afterwards. And then you were at WashU for a while, and then came to St. Louis. I was a professor at WashU for twenty four years or twenty three years, I guess, and then uh, and then saw the opportunity at St. Luke's and uh, couldn't pass it up, and uh, haven't looked back, and love every minute of it. And, 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 you know, you're not going to say this, so I will, but you're, you're one of the most beloved physicians at St. Luke's. Anybody who's your patient um, has a strong relationship with you. And I think that's kind of one of the things that makes St. Luke's special. Well, I, I appreciate it. And that, uh, that is actually said about you uh, universally. So uh, I appreciate right. you saying that, but uh, it's what makes St. Luke's very, very special is that doctors that are at St. Luke's really love to take care of patients. They love their patients. And Having that philosophy is what attracted me here and keeps me here. Yeah, very good. So today I want to talk about um, coronary artery disease and um, and ways to, uh, well, first of all, um, you know, what is coronary artery disease and, and what's the prevalence and then ways to reduce um, our risk. Uh, coronary artery disease and heart disease uh, overall is uh, by far the most common cause of death uh, in the uh, United States. Um, in both men and, importantly, in women. Um, and coronary artery disease is when one develops uh, areas of cholesterol buildup and blockage within the arteries. Uh, as that progresses at some point in time, that can lead to a total blockage or near total blockage of the arteries, and that can cause sudden cardiac death, and it can lead to heart failure. It can lead to, of course, acute heart attacks. Um, in addition uh, to uh, disability and people that uh, just can't do what they'd like to do in life. Mm-hmm. And so it, it certainly can decrease the length of your life and the quality of your life. Absolutely. And so um, I, I, um, I'm, you know, I'm a big proponent of um, doing things without medication um, first, if you can. Um, and for some people, I think um, that will work. Uh, you know, by changing diet and exercise habits and things like that. But there's certainly a percentage of the population that despite doing kind of all that due to their genetics and things like that, they still can have high blood pressure and, and coronary artery disease. Very important. You know, I think it's important uh, to discuss sort of what are the risk factors. Uh, and then when we look at what those risk factors are, we can figure out what we as individuals can do to decrease those risk factors uh, and where we really have to rely on our physicians. Uh, and the first thing is to, to realize, are you at risk for heart disease? Uh, and really, everyone's at risk for heart disease. Okay. Yeah. What are the risk factors that really uh, are present that can increase those risks? First and foremost, just like in cancer, cigarette smoking. Uh, cigarette smokers have a tremendously increased risk of heart disease. Uh, and uh, that goes on for periods of time after one stops smoking. So if one is a smoker currently, obviously, you got to stop. Uh, and then the second thing is if you've had a history of cigarette smoking, cigarette smoking directly damages actually the uh, lining of the blood vessels and leads to this early process of developing blockages. So that's number one. Uh, number two uh, is, uh, is that uh, high blood pressure is very important, that uh, the stress of the high blood pressure on those blood vessels over time 
and can lead to further blockages and can also lead to other problems uh, with strokes uh, in addition to weakness or thickness of the heart muscle over time. Uh, the third uh, is having a, a high cholesterol. Uh, and uh, again, there's a little bit of a problem with high cholesterols because cholesterols have different particles that are present. Um, so it's more than just knowing your cholesterol. It's knowing your cholesterol profile, uh, which is very important. Uh, and the next is diabetes. Uh, and knowing whether or not that you have diabetes and the appropriate treatment of it, that also increases one risk. And um, lastly, but really, really, really very, very important, uh, is actually a family history of heart disease. You know, did other family members have heart disease? What age were they when they had heart disease? Um, you know, if uh, you know, was there something else on top of it to family history? You know, was uh, the the loved one that had heart disease was it somebody that smoked, had diabetes, um, and had high blood pressure? Or was it somebody that just started having heart disease young? These are all critical. Uh, so once one knows that, then the uh, it's important to talk with your physician regarding how do you attack it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and, you know, kind of going through this, um, you know, I have kind of a vague understanding of coronary artery disease, but it, like everything in life, it's way more complex than you would think. Um, with the, the, um, uh, you, you know, s- some of the modifiable risk factors uh, can be diet. Is there a specific diet you recommend to patients either before they have an event or after? Well, our Western diet, uh, our fast food diet, um, is uh, is very unhealthy in general, mm-hmm. um, not just for heart disease, but in your territory of cancer yeah. um, and other things. But, you know, uh, having more of a plant-based diet uh, is, uh, is, is an important way to prevent heart disease. Um, in addition to that, uh, a, a Mediterranean-type diet, uh, which is, again, high in um, uh, in uh, appropriate um, oils such as uh, olive oil, high in fish intake, low in red meat intake, are important to help to prevent heart disease. Yeah, the the stats I have on that are Mediterranean diet gives you about a 25 to 30 percent reduction, um, a low salt diet or the DASH diet, which mm-hmm. contributes to high blood pressure. Absolutely. Reduces it about 25 percent. A vegan diet gives you the strongest reduction at about 35 to 40 percent. Vegetarian, so it's no meat, but you do have dairy, is 25 to 30 percent. Pescatarian, fish only, is about the same. And so, you know, this is, you know, that it's, but it's hard to develop new habits. Right. It's hard, it's hard to make those changes. Um, making the changes slowly uh, is easy. And it's, unfortunately, once my patients do have problems, they're pretty good about making those changes, you know, but the idea is to make those changes before there's problems. Yeah. Yeah, Particularly, you know, if you know that, um, you know, one's father had, you know, heart disease uh, in their 50s and you're in your uh, 20s and 30s, you should be making changes. You should be going to this before it's too late. Um, So the diet is very important. The other thing we haven't really talked about, Jason, is also exercise. For sure. You know, so, you know, exercise is incredibly important. You know, we are now realizing it doesn't take a lot, okay? Um, so um, there were some recent studies that actually said as little as five minutes of exercise a day um, is important for some reduction. Yeah. You know, what we recommend in general for our patients, once you know that you don't have heart disease, you know, if you're sitting there having chest discomfort, you have strong, all these risk factors, um, then we want you to talk to their doctors before exercising. But once you know that that's not a case, uh, we like um, at least about 150 minutes of exercise a day. And and this is, a lot of people recommend this kind of like zone two, like brisk walking, things like right. that. You know, one uh, one uh, thing that I like to tell my patients, I actually once heard it from our, our head of cardiac rehab uh, here, who's, uh, who's wonderful, but is that your patients uh, should be able to, when they're walking, should be able to carry on a conversation. Yeah. Okay. But you shouldn't be able to sing. Okay. 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 Well, I can't sing anyway, but, <laughs> uh, but that gives you some idea. You want to go ahead and you want to have some you know, degree of uh, activity. And, you know, again, for me and for, you have to find something that you like and what's good and put it in your, into your uh, daily schedule. It doesn't count that you, well, I'm very active always on my feet all the time. No. Yeah. It's really sunny. I mean, you know, I wake up, you know, before five o'clock every day, you know, and I'm on that elliptical, Yeah. Um, you know, for, 
for my uh, six days a week of exercise. And that's low impact. It's low impact. Yeah. And, you know, I can read you while can I'm it. on that. I can, I can listen to a podcast. Yeah. You know, I can do something, you know, while I'm doing it that, uh, that adds to the enrichment of my day. You know, and if you put that as part of your schedule uh, and it becomes part of your life, it's amazing what it can do for your health and also your mental well-being. Yeah. Uh, uh, earlier this year, a report came out. Um, I believe it was the New England Journal of Medicine showing that exercise is about twice as good at, as the antidepressant medications for depression, which absolutely. is not, not surprising. I mean, absolutely. Me and you both get mental health benefits from working out. Absolutely. Um, the, um, and then, um, I've actually seen some reports where sauna, you know, can due to the vasodilation, uh, from the heat can improve endothelial function, reduce all cause mortality. And, and they think it's mediated through the cardiovascular yes, system. And can, you want to make sure you don't have critical heart disease you okay. know, before that, you know, and there is the thing that makes me nervous. Some people are on also the, the ice sort of approach of things of, you know, put, going into ice baths for cardiovascular disease. That's like, that scares me. Yeah. yeah, especially ones at risk. So that's something that uh, that is a fad that does disturb me. Yeah, I, I think, and I think that the data for um, the uh, sauna is much better than Absolutely. the ice baths. Absolutely, um, and sauna's been around for a long time. With ice baths, you're going to have at least peripheral vasoconstriction, which is going to put some stress on the heart. Absolutely, and so and and uh, and a sauna is much more palatable than an yes, ice it bath. Is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Love a sauna. <laughs> um, okay, so, so now. Two things. Some of the patients can eat an optimal diet or exercise appropriately and still be at a significant risk. Um, and, you know, some of the predictors um, for this would be uh, high triglycerides, um, high cholesterol, and then there's this ApoB uh, protein. Can you talk a little bit about these patients and, and those markers? Yeah, really, um, there's another incredibly important marker um, that... Uh, that I've been uh, involved in looking at for many, many years, um, since the 1990s, uh, and now it's ready for prime time. So um, one has to look at what is their overall LDL cholesterol, which is the overall bad cholesterol, okay. the overall HDL cholesterol. Uh, HDL uh, is best looked at as a scavenger cholesterol, a good cholesterol, okay? It sort of cleans up those arteries, okay? Triglycerides is another lipid particle uh, that at high levels can also lead to early atherosclerosis, those blockages in those arteries. Okay, but another one, um, which is very, very powerful and important in family history, is something called LP little A. Okay, um, ApoB uh, we measure in patients um, that have high triglycerides in, in, in particular. That's important, but LP little A is critical. When we find out that patients that have high LP little A's have a marked increase in early heart disease and strokes. So I've known this and was involved through the Lipid Center at WashU for many years. So started measuring this in my patients very, very early um, and found this in many of the patients that have early onset of heart disease and family histories. Uh, and now we have three agents that are in clinical trials. I'm hoping the first agent may be available as soon as next year. Wow that dramatically decreases this. Uh, and uh, what this is is sort of a sticky uh, particle that's a part of the, uh, that how the cholesterol is carried in the body that allows it to get right into the blood vessel um, and is handled and can cause increased strokes and increased heart disease. So not only is it um, a marker, but it's also a causative it agent. Is, it is a causative agent. What we're waiting for, we know that these agents right now, and the first agent likely to come out is going to be a once a month shot. Okay. Um, but we know that, the, that it definitely is causative. Um, we know that these agents decrease this way over 90% um, uh, as far as what the LP little a is. And what we're waiting on is outcome data, and I'm hopeful the outcome data is going to be out in the spring of, uh, of next year. That's great. Um, and so, uh, so, so the link between the diet and the cholesterol really is the trans fats and the saturated fats. Yeah, it and, is. And the simple sugars, it too. Is. It but, is. And even, you know, again, one thing that I'd like to concentrate on in, in addition to prevention and diet uh, is, as you mentioned very early on, uh, is that uh, medicines are required okay, yeah. in a lot of patients. Okay. So this is a genetic problem. This is a genetic problem of how our liver produces and how much our liver produces these particles, okay? You know, and uh, in some patients, about 25% of patients 
may be what we call hyperabsorbers. And I, I can actually test for that with, with specialized testing, where we know that, well, it's actually more what you're eating. Uh, and, you know, we've heard, you know, it doesn't matter how much eggs you eat, et cetera. Well, it does in some people. Yeah. Okay. You know, so, but the important thing is cutting down that production. And diet only does a small percentage of that. So if one is really at risk, let's say that there's an early family history, let's say that the HDLs are low, or you have high LP little A's, that group of patients has to be on medicines. So, so you know, you, you take in cholesterol, but the liver, even if you're a vegan and taking almost no cholesterol, the produce. liver is going to make cholesterol, and in some patients, a large amount. Yeah, it's going to produce, uh, and that's where you have to uh, do it. And, you know, really, um, statins have been the most important uh, preventative uh, for heart disease and also for s- secondary prevention. What a secondary prevention means, that means that once somebody has actually had a cardiac event or been diagnosed with coronary disease, being on them dramatically decreases risk. And, and so the, they came out with these statins that lower cholesterol. Uh, and, and I know, um, you know, Pharmacia, it was Pharmacia Pfizer at the time here in town, um, you know, made like Lipitor and it, it did an excellent job at reducing that. But the medications have become much more sophisticated it like the ones you're talking about in the clinical trials. Yeah, so we have we have many medications. So statins still are the mainstay. Okay, um, and uh, with statins as the mainstay, they have gotten a hideous press. Um, you know, I uh, somebody who may be president was talking about fake news a lot. Okay, <laughs> so fake news for statins has really, really cost cost lives. Yeah, um, and that uh, statins are extremely well cal- tolerated by probably ninety five percent of the people that are on them. Uh, most cardiologists, if you ask around, including me, we're on statins. Okay. And, but what are the, is the five percent? What What are the reasons that they can't take the statins? Or have it's usually muscle aches and pains. Yeah, yeah. You know, so if you have some people, virtually everybody has a little bit of spasms occasionally. Some really feel like they have the flu. They really have really awful aches and pains. And we have so many other alternatives right now. Okay. You know, so that you know, right now, um, I frequently prescribe uh, really three agents. Two are the same. Um, they're called PC, PCSK9 inhibitors that the patient simply gives themselves a shot um, twice a month. Okay. Uh, it's an auto-injector, and it drops cholesterol like nothing. Okay. It also does drop um, LP little a about 20 25%. There is another agent that we use, believe it or not, that we give twice a year. Um, and again, for patients that don't tolerate it or they don't want to take medicines or can't inject themselves, they go to an infusion center or to some physician offices, uh, and uh, it's a infusion that goes on just a shot that goes in. Uh, initially, we give it um, twice, three times the first year, and then twice every year after that. Again, dramatic effects on LDL cholesterol, really lowering it dramatically. In addition to having a twenty-five to thirty percent reduction in LP little A's. And so, um, and so, th- th- they. I want to kind of zoom out and kind of take a, a, a bigger look at, um, you know, we were talking about pe- people being skeptical, which is okay. It's okay to be skeptical, but the, the clinical trials kind of give you the, the, what you need. And it's a, it's, you get the drug or you don't get the drug. And then they measure some metric down the road like survival. And so it doesn't mean that the drug doesn't have any side effects, but it means that the risks and benefits of taking the drug for these patients outweigh the risks and benefits of any side effects from the drug. Right. Is that accurate? It's it's not even close. You know, yeah. So that um, if you look at the overall benefits of our per, for protection against heart attacks and death, uh, it is, uh, they're game changers. And there's no increased mortality. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of false data about, oh, it, affect, it causes Alzheimer's or memory problems. That's wrong. Uh, it actually decreases vascular dementia. Um, you know, so um, as far as... Uh, you know, the tolerability, I have, you know, thousands of patients probably um, that are on statins and tolerate them very, very well. And the important thing is if you don't tolerate, you work with your physician. There's also um, one thing that we I'd like to talk about at some point, uh, Jason, is also how do you, what are some of the newer techniques? So how do we detect? Do we have a problem? And what are we talking about? Welcome back to Doc Discussions with Dr. Jason Edwards. Medical news you can use, no appointment necessary. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and so, um, and so there's, um, you know, there was the old uh, catheterization and like actually look at the artery, but there's some new imaging techniques where you can look at what is it, calcium scores and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the important thing is not to only be aware that you are at risk, but do you have a problem? Okay. Because um, you know, putting your head in the sand and not looking uh, can lead to very bad outcomes. Yeah. You know, so um, we have uh, advanced imaging. I'm practicing cardiology different now than I was eight years ago, okay, because of the new techniques that we have. So the new techniques we'll start with, one is not a new technique. One is a calcium CT scan. Okay. And a calcium CT scan uh, is cheap. Um, I think St. Luke's does it for, I don't know, don't quote me on this, maybe $125. That sort of range is an out-of-pocket expense. Don't ask me why insurance companies don't cover it because it's been proven to identify patients at risk uh, tremendously. seems like it would be cost effective. It, it would be. We a... would think it would be cost effective, but there are fears it leads to other testing, which it can, which okay. is, saves lives. Um, but it's an out-of-pocket expense that's, that's very, very small. Um, and what that tells us is, is there calcium in the arteries? Mainly helpful in people over 40 and probably less than 70 um, that can identify whether or not there's calcium buildup. Calcium, though, is not really the blockage. Calcium is a marker that somebody has had plaques in their arteries, and the body in healing it then forms a calcium. Okay, so then the next step is um, how much is there, and depending on how much there is determines what one's risk is. But in addition to that, I like to explain to my patients the following. I like to say that um, that when cholesterol is deposited in one's arteries, uh, the calcium, it's sort of like a volcano. It's like a mountain. You can either put down the calcium like a road where there's no blockages, or you can have like a mountain where there is a degree of blockage. And if it, uh, if it really heaps up, and then it can interfere with blood flow. When it interferes with blood flow, that's when somebody can have chest discomfort with activity. That's what can predispose to heart attacks. There are patients, 25 to 40% of patients, more in patients that have diabetes, that can have significant blockages and have zero symptoms. Uh, and that is also something that has to be identified. So once we have whether or not there's calcium present or not, um, there are other tests that we do. We have nuclear stress testing, uh, where uh, we, first of all, it was simple stress testing. So one can get on a treadmill under doctor's supervision, and we can look for whether or not there's any problems uh, with uh, their exercise. That picks up heart disease about 65% of the time if it's present. Not very good. If we add an echo to that and we do an ultrasound of the heart while we're they're exercising, that increases us to about 75% accuracy. Okay, so getting better. Yeah. If we then go to nuclear testing, we may go to 80%. The newest is the stress PET scan. The stress PET scan has 75% less radiation, increases us to about 92%. And one of the very, very, very exciting uh, areas right now uh, is CAT scanning of the arteries with intravenous dye called CT angiography. That's almost as good as a heart catheterization. So we can do everything that I just said to identify heart disease and risk stratify without a heart catheterization. You know, I'm going to kind of go back. And th that's, that's excellent news, especially if you can avoid a procedure. Um, the, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, and I often say this to patients. If you have plaque in the arteries of your heart, you probably have plaque in the arteries of your brain. Correct. And, and so uh, I I... I, I'm, if you're a neurologist and you're, you know, don't scream at me, but I think a lot of dementia is called a lot of things that ends up being vascular dementia. Correct. And that's something that can dramatically reduce the quality of your life. And, you, you know, in general, um, it's difficult, to, you know, to make these lifestyle changes or to go into a cardiologist when you feel, you know, totally normal. But it, it's, I think it has to be some emotional event in your life that can kind of push you towards that, whether it's a medical scare with you or a family member, or maybe you're pregnant, or maybe you have cancer, or you have something that kind of triggers some emotion that causes you to say, hey, you know what, I'm, I need to kind of like look out for my long-term health, um, not only for my cardiac health, but for the health of my brain. And I mean, it, you know, if you have plaque in the arteries of your heart, it, you, you probably are going to have some sort of arterial disease that can cause kidney disease. And so in many ways, your blood flow is your health. Absolutely. And again, uh, 
a huge percentage of our patients that have MRIs don't have the brain. They have something called small vessel disease. Yeah. If you have more extensive of that, you have small strokes everywhere, and that leads to dementia. What's the treatment for small vessel disease? Same thing it is for heart disease. We yeah. lower cholesterols. We lower blood pressures. We look at these risk factors. I want to come back to one more thing. I was talking about my volcano, okay? Yeah. So the reason why that's important uh, is that um, there is a, a mountain, okay, and a volcano, okay, if it's a mountain, doesn't do anything if there's no magna underneath the surface, if there's no lava that would come to the surface. So what the treatments do that I'm talking about, when we drop those cholesterols, we start getting rid of the soft cholesterol gunk underneath the volcano, that we get rid of the lava, we turn that magna into rock, okay? And when that happens, within a month of, of lowering it, event rates, which includes heart attacks and strokes, come down dramatically. That's surprising that it works that quickly. It can start within a month. Now, people can, ha okay, so we're, we're jumping back and forth, but, we are. but, but, which is fine. Um, so the, the artery, which is like a tube, mm -hmm. you can have plaque that can narrow the artery, but you can also have plaque that goes into the artery. And then there are stable plaques, which, correct. and then you can have unstable plaques where if you, and so if you, and, and I might be wrong on this, but you can have an unstable plaque that grows into the artery, so you sure. don't see narrowing. But if it breaks off, the platelets immediately adhere to it, right. and you have this uh, acute event where all of a sudden the, the artery was, the blood was flowing fine through the artery. Now the plaque breaks off, the platelets adhere to it, and you immediately have a blockage. Exactly right. So that's what you're talking about. So if the volcano erupts and you get the gunk that comes to the surface, yeah. or you have a crack in the surface, like an earthquake, in that, and then that soft plaque comes to the surface, then the blood starts clotting and you go from a 50 or 60% to 99 or 100%. That's a heart attack or God forbid, that's sudden death. And quickly, that's quickly. That's very quickly. And and sudden death is, uh, you know, one of the leading, uh, you know, if you say, what's the first symptom of a heart attack? Um, you know, a lot of people may say chest pain and that may be number one, but sudden death is up there. Absolutely. First, I like to never say chest pain. Okay, so what I tell my patients uh, and I tell my residents and my fellows when I teach them, never just ch say chest pain because my patients will say to me very, very frequently, I never have chest pain. Do you ever have an uncomfortableness in your chest? Do you ever have a fullness? Do you ever have an indigestion discomfort? Physicians um, have been known uh, to you know, think they have indigestion uh, when it's really their heart. Okay, so first of all, yes. So the onset of some kind of uncomfortableness or shortness of breath with activity um, or uncomfortable pressure um, is something that absolutely is a marker of heart. But sudden death, yes, unfortunately, can be the first manifestation. And and then um, and then the incidence of this increases with each decade of life. Yes, the the incidence within the forties is not very high, but once you get to the sixties, you, you know your your likelihood is um, what what. 20 to 40 percent, depending on whether you're a, a man or, or, or no, I have, sorry, I have 21 percent in men and 11 percent in women. In the 70s, it goes from 35 percent in men to 24 in women. So th that's a generalization. Yeah that's, yeah, that's a rough idea as of where it is. But yes, yeah. it becomes more frequent. And it's also, I've also, um, unfortunately for, for the listeners, I've taken care of many patients in their 20s. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, in 30s with, with early onset of heart disease, including women. And with diets getting worse over time, you know, I think that's a trend when they update the data, they're going to see that there's more yes. heart disease in the young. Yes. And so, all right, well, Craig, uh, fascinating talk. I feel like we could talk all day, but I, I very much appreciate your time, sir. And, um, thank you for being a, a great colleague and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me and I'd be happy to join you anytime. Thanks, Craig. Thank you for joining us for this episode of doc discussions with Dr. Jason Edwards. Be sure to check out our other episodes and tell your friends.